Ah, yes. Being tall. It's something that everyone wishes for. But what if that wish came true? What if you got more than you bargained for? What if you became so tall that you were a danger to everyone and everything around you? Well, that's what this episode is all about. It's a movie called War of the Colossal Beast from 1958. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the program. And on this episode, you're gonna find out what happened to a man who became too big for his own good. Now, this movie is actually a sequel to 1957's The Amazing Colossal Man. In that movie, Colonel Glenn Manning gets caught in the explosion of a plutonium bomb during a test detonation. For some reason, this doesn't kill him. In fact, he starts growing rapidly. He gets so big that the military has to keep him in a circus tent and feed him whole turkeys as a snack. Now, you may be thinking, hey, that doesn't sound so bad. Free rent, free food. Well, I want you to stop and think about what it would actually be like to have to eat turkey every single day. I mean, yeah, for the first few days, it would be awesome. It would be like Thanksgiving all the time. But then after that, I don't know, I think you get sick of it. And sometimes that's all it takes, you know, just one bad experience or one bad memory with a certain food to ruin it for years, if not for the rest of your life. It could have been great the first hundred times you had it, but then you have it that one time and it's bad, and that just gets stuck in your brain. You can't get it out. Eventually, Glenn begins to go crazy. <laughs> So Glenn escapes and goes on a rampage, a giant 60-foot man who's very angry. And kind of a perv, if you ask me. So they come up with a serum to stop Glenn from growing and put it in this comically large needle. And that's the thing, they'd have to take the time to get that custom made, right? I mean, it's not like they have a bunch of those sitting in the back of the medical supply room. They inject him, but this just pisses him off. Then they shoot him, and he falls awkwardly off Boulder Dam, and that's the end of that movie. War of the Colossal Beast starts off in Mexico with a young man driving a truck and getting it stuck in the mud. He gets out and, oh no, water. If only he could have seen that coming through the window. And to make things worse, it looks like he is allergic. Now we have John Swanson arriving at the police station to report his stolen truck. Dark green steak bed truck, ten and a half, California license, loaded with groceries. Loaded with groceries? Okay, this is a serious crime now. I mean, in this day and age, that means the cargo was probably worth more than the truck. So I was stocking up on supplies, bringing this truckload of groceries down from Calexico. Get the picture? Get the picture? Get the picture? Get the picture? There's nothing more annoying than somebody who's telling you a story and constantly checking in to see if you're still listening. You know, especially if you're just not interested in what they're saying. See, this is why I could never be a cop. I can't listen to people drone on about their problems, you know? Like, oh, somebody stole your truck? Uh, all right, uh, I don't know what you want me to do. Uh, I don't get the picture. So John tells the sergeant that he hired some kid, Miguel, to drive his truck and then he just disappeared and the sergeant is like holy crap we have a kid who matches that description in the hospital which is right across the street that's him where's my truck now you might think this guy crossed a line by grabbing this kid and shaking him in a hospital bed but i don't think so do you remember what was in that truck yeah, I've shook people in hospital beds for far less. My grandfather was in the hospital with cancer once, and I thought I would cheer him up by playing some checkers with him. The guy won every game, and after every win, he celebrated like he had won the lottery. And then the smack talk was just nonstop. Like, what did he say one time? I think he said uh, something like, uh, gee, I wish beating cancer was as easy as beating you. Meanwhile, Glenn Manning's sister, Joyce, hears about John's missing food truck on the news. Mr. Swanson says something must have carried off his truck. Now, what could have carried off his truck? I, for one, find it amazing that a missing truck even made the news in the first place. But what's even more amazing is that this convinces Joyce 
that her brother survived the 700 foot fall and is still alive. I mean, it all adds up, right? You know, the truck was full of food and Glenn likes to eat and he's really big, so he needs a lot of food. So there you go. Pieces of the puzzle are all falling into place. So Joyce and Major Baird meet up with Mr. Swanson and they're like, hey, John, when you were looking for your truck, did you see any tracks? You know, like uh, footprints, the kind of footprints that would be left by a man who's 60 feet tall. Look, lady, leave me out of this. I didn't see no giant. I didn't see anything. I've got enough trouble with the insurance company as it is. And honestly, I'm gonna have to side with Swanson on this one because insurance companies will do whatever they can not to pay out. You start mentioning giants and they're gonna be like, oh, well then, uh, unfortunately, you never opted for coverage under our monsters, giants, and demons policy, which still excludes ghosts. We consider that an act of God. So Major Baird is like, look, Joyce, you gotta give it up. Your brother died in that fall. He died big time. And if it wasn't the fall that killed him, it was definitely all the ordnance they shot him with, okay? It's time to move on. Thank you for coming. I'm afraid it wasn't worth your while. It could be if you'd have dinner with me this evening. Oh, okay. See, it's all starting to make sense now. I mean, why would a missing truck lead him to believe that a 60-foot man would be involved? He just wanted to see Joyce again so he could ask her out. I mean, what is this world coming to, you know? Can't a woman search for her giant freak of a brother who got that way because he was exposed to radiation from an atomic bomb without getting hit on? So Joyce is like, dude, I can't go out with you. I gotta go to Mexico to track down my brother. Plus the beer is cheap. Joyce visits Miguel in his room, but the dude is frozen from shock. Then suddenly in the middle of the night, Miguel starts freaking out. So she calls to the sergeant like, hey, Miguel is screaming and it's waking me up, kind of annoying. I'm uncomfortable enough as it is sleeping in this chair. Miguel starts screaming at the top of his lungs, but then he goes right back to sleep. She tries asking him about the giant, but he's either in shock or just ignoring her. And the thing is, the sergeant told her that he only speaks a bit of English, but it's not like he wouldn't understand what she's saying. She's just calling his name. Miguel, Miguel. And honestly, if I was in this situation, there's just no way that I could stand there quiet. Like you literally just jumped up screaming and now you're out cold. I'd be pouring water on this guy's face, grabbing him like, get up, God damn it. Tell us about this giant. We need answers. This lady's missing her brother and some guy's missing his truck. See, that's why I couldn't be a doctor though. Cause my methods would be questionable. Effective, no doubt, but Definitely questionable. So they go to the location where Miguel drove the truck off the road, and this is where they find a giant footprint. The foot that made that print is about 10 times the size of a normal man. That would make him about 60 feet tall. I like how he kind of had to do some estimating in his head first, as if this giant footprint would have been left by some other giant. Like, yeah, it's big, but 60 feet big? I don't know. I'm thinking more like 45. <sighs> okay, well, let's keep looking. Maybe something else will turn up. So they're like, hmm, where would a giant go? Hey, maybe those mountains. That seems like a place a giant would hide because, yeah. They go out there and Joyce says, look, it's Swanson's truck. And the sergeant is like, nah, it's the wrong color. Oh well, we better get out of here because it's getting late and I don't get paid for overtime. So they go back to the police station where they're served from a bowl full of, uh, I don't know, wet bones and strands of various meats. Baird comes in and is like, all right, the military is standing by. We just have to pinpoint Glenn and he's dead. And Joyce is like, hey, um, how about you don't kill my brother? Just take me up into those mountains. I can reason with him. But Baird says, nah, it's too dangerous. But can't you let it go at that? Well, you don't even know if he'll recognize you or not. Yeah, because even though you're his sister, he's really big now. So you would look really small to him. And he probably doesn't want to hang out with us small people. Tall people are notorious for hating small people. Everybody knows that. So just let us kill him. And I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll take you out to dinner to make it up to you. No big deal. 
So Joyce is like, look, I don't care if I have to go alone. I'm going up into those mountains. Maybe I'll just go topless, who knows? And Baron is like, all right, let's go. On top of the mountain, it looks like the problem is even worse than they thought. It appears Glenn has been stealing trucks, raiding them for food, and then not even returning them. Rude. And it looks like Glenn had part of his face blown off at the end of the last movie, which really sucks, but at the same time, I have to say, if you're gonna be a giant who's going around causing shit, you might as well look like a badass. And this is a pretty hardcore look, you know what I mean? Like if everybody's gonna treat you like a monster, you might as well look like a monster. So they come up with the idea of baking bread with drugs in it, so that when he eats it, it will knock him out. Which is pretty presumptuous if you ask me. I mean, what if he has a gluten allergy, or he's on a carb-free diet, then what? Then you're all gonna look pretty stupid. You're gonna be left with a bunch of druggy bread on your hands that you can't even give away, because it's filled with drugs. I mean, I would take some, but that's only because I don't believe in letting good food go to waste. Baird is like, look, we gotta get him before he moves to another mountain. Because you know how these giant bachelors are, always moving from mountain to mountain. If we don't get him before he decides to move to another mountain, we may lose contact with him for weeks. Do you know what it would be like to be just sitting around waiting for news? You mind if I suggest a remedy? Distract yourself by coming up with new ideas for games, especially games where the pieces spill all over the place. Like, check this out. I made this tower out of wooden blocks, and the idea is that you and another person go back and forth, taking out a block and building the tower higher. And eventually, the tower gets so high that it falls over, and the blocks go all over the f***ing place, and you have to spend a bunch of time picking up all the blocks and building the tower again. So you actually spend just as much time, if not more, setting up the game than actually playing it. So it's a great time waster. And the only way to win is through the other person's failure, which is why I call this game Tower of Failure. My sister, she wants to call it uh, Jenga. I mean, look, she even carved the word into all the wooden blocks. And I'm sorry, but I'm pretty sure Tower of Failure is a much better name than, you know, Jenga, Jenga, whatever. Anyways, Glenn eats the bread and passes out, so they keep him in an airplane hangar until they figure out what to do with him. But of course, he wakes up and escapes because these ropes are basically good for nothing. So they scramble the Air Force so that they can just shoot him with some gas. And I have to say, maybe if you just left him alone in the mountains, you wouldn't have to do all this. Sure, you'd have to send out a bunch of food to him every now and then to keep him happy, but no, you couldn't do that. You just had to drug him up and chain him down. And you know what I think? I think you're all just jealous. Yeah, yeah, I think this is height discrimination. I find it offensive and I won't stand for it. Yeah, that's right, so what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do to me? You gonna gas me too? Anyways, now they have him subdued with chains. Probably should have done this in the first place. I know 10 gallons is a lot, but Dr. Carmichael explained the case to you this morning. Will you talk to the Red Cross people, please? They refuse to send any more plasma for Glenn. They say we've used too much already. My men and I will see that you get back all the blood we use for this case. Yeah, that's not really how this works. See, it's not a rental. We don't want the blood back after it's been in somebody's body. <laughs> I mean, it's used. The hell's wrong with you? Gross. The next day they hook him up to this machine and show him slides to see if he has curable amnesia. Either that or they're trying to bore him to death with home movies. The plan is to put Glenn on a boat and send him off to live on an island somewhere. So this is kind of like a reverse King Kong. And you know what? That doesn't sound so bad. Apparently they're gonna send out an inspection party every month to make sure he's okay. So that's a pretty good deal in my opinion. An entire island, you get plenty of sun, lots of privacy, like sign me up. I mean, there is the whole isolation thing, but I don't know. I think people in general are kind of overrated, but apparently Glenn isn't too thrilled about it and he escapes again Wow, what a surprise. Suddenly they get word that he's been spotted at Griffith Park. The military shows up with a bunch of spotlights and tanks and shit. At the same time, a group of kids are there as 
part of a field trip, I guess? Glenn then picks up the school bus full of kids, and you might be thinking that this is a really horrible situation, but I don't know, don't you typically lose at least a few kids on a field trip anyways? I thought that was kind of the point of field trips, you know, like a survival of the fittest sort of thing, whoever makes it back makes it back. I was lucky, I always made it back. So Joyce gets there and she's like, hey Glenn, put down that bus. And I guess that is what makes Glenn realize who he is and the fact that he'll never be a normal size again is too much for him to handle. So he takes his own life by grabbing the power lines and I don't know why, but they shot this very last scene in color for some reason. So there you go. I guess being super tall isn't all it's cracked up to be. Now, both of these movies were produced and directed by Burt I. Gordon. And if that name sounds familiar at all, it's because I recently talked about another movie he did, Attack of the Puppet People, a movie that shows the dangers of being too small. In fact, this movie was originally distributed as part of a double feature with Attack of the Puppet People. But one thing I noticed is that just like Attack of the Puppet People, we once again have a title that is kind of misleading. I mean, there really wasn't a war here. It was more like a search, if anything. And calling him a beast is kind of a stretch. I mean, just because he's missing part of his face doesn't make him an animal. But there is a good reason for why they added that facial disfigurement to the character. It's to disguise the fact that this is actually a different actor than in the original movie. Glenn Manning was played by Glenn Langan in The Amazing Colossal Man and by Dean Parkin in War of the Colossal Beast. Dean also played the role of the Cyclops in the movie The Cyclops, which came out the year before this. So you can see where they got some of the makeup from. And who made that movie? No surprise, Burt I. Gordon. But that's pretty much it for this one. As usual, thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you all next time. Let me tell you about this other game I'm working on. So have you ever felt like you need some more stress in your life? Well, this game involves a timer, a board attached to a spring, and a bunch of little pieces in weird shapes. So you gotta put the pieces in the right spot before the timer goes out, otherwise, yeah, that's right. The pieces go all over the place. And I like to call that one, You Better Be Perfect. And that name is not changing. It is starting to get hot. And I've got the suit on. The Galaxy Liner was, well, it was a choice. And I do not regret it. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do to me? You going to gas me too? You going to drug me? You going to chain me up? We'll go ahead. Yeah, do your worst. Um, okay, actually, yeah, now that I've said that out loud, I can see how that, in combination with other things I've said on the show in the past, might lead people to think that I'm into that sort of thing. I'm not. Uh, but then again, I've never tried it, so... Like, come on, man. I'm obviously letting you win some of these games here. I know how to play checkers. It's not hard.